I am so excited and I'm trying again very hard not to fangirl at this incredible woman because she is so talented and so sweet. You are officially invited to the Angela episode today because I am sitting next to the fabulous and very fashionable Angela M. Sanders. You are totally making me blush, Angela. <laughs> it's very well deserved praise. <laughs> and it was so funny because when I first saw your book listed, I saw the title and I'm going, oh, this pun is hysterical. I love it. And again, I know you're not supposed to judge a book by its cover <laughs> and I was loving it. And then I looked down and saw the name and it said Angela M. And I'm Angela Maria. So I'm Angela Marie. <laughs> I was so excited. Okay, so that's what the beginning of it would look like on a book cover. I'm like, I gotta support her. My fellow Angela, I have to read this book now. So as soon as I got the art mailed, I'm going, and we're putting this at the top of TBR. And then I loved it. So I'm like, okay, she doesn't just have a great name. She's a great writer too. So I am just so excited and I know I'm gushing over you, but I'm just so appreciative of you. I love Paranormal Cozies. And there were kind of a spike of them probably 15 years ago, 10, 15. And then there was kind of a little bit of a lull. And then here you are and you're doing the magical with the library. And then you have the cozy companion and you're creating your own world. It's just, you're making it so much fun for the cozy readers. So it was so hard to think about like, how do you make a witch? I mean, cause you don't want a witch to be able to go like, ching, you know, there's the murderer and now they're in jail. <laughs> But I wanted like I wanted to make a magic system that yeah. made sense, and so I thought, well, I'm gonna limit it to yeah. books. It's like she has to get her energy from books, and I love books, and there's so much energy that goes into writing a book and reading a book. It's like when I write it, there's this world in my head, but when you read it, yeah. there's a world in your head, and it might be different or it might be kind of the same. See, I love the fact that you incorporated it into the narrative because sometimes you'll be in a setting and it's one of those, it could be a tea shop or a coffee shop. We could be in a restaurant for like Italian food or French food. You're like, you could just pick it up and place it somewhere else. Uh -huh. I love that you have the grounded setting because you feel as if you're entering the small town. Oregon, I always feel yeah. like I'm gonna mispronounce it because of my Bostonian accent. Yeah, like, Oregon, Oregon or Oregon. Yeah, we call it Oregon, but you can call it Oregon. I was gonna say, I love the setting with it. And so I was just curious because I feel as if the only other one I know about is Ellie Alexander's uh -huh. tales. Yeah. So I'm going, she's even bringing the Organ love back. Oh yeah, yeah. Kate. So Kate, or Ellie Alexander, yeah. she's a good friend and I love her and I adore her books. So any comparison to her makes me very happy. <laughs> As soon as you said I was like, she actually knows her real name. <laughs> yeah. I'm an insider. <laughs> you are too, apparently. Well, now I am. I Because I always have those moments of, what's your name? I'm not really sure. How do I, do you want your pen name? Do you want your author name? What, yeah. yeah. It's like, am I being rude if I call you this way? Because there's there's one author, her pen name is Lorraine, but her real name's Jan. I'm like, do you want me to call you Jan? I'm like, is it Lorraine? Those are really different. Yeah. Exactly. They're not even... At least if it was like Liv versus Olivia, you're like, okay, we get the nickname yeah. going. <laughs> yeah. yeah. But I mean, you have a lovely name. And, and oh, well, I know it's really good. Is it? this your is this your actual name? This is my actual name, <laughs> which is kind of rare now in Cozy Land. I it's guess rare. my parents. I remember they said that they were gonna name me Elizabeth or Donna, but then when I was born, they decided on Angela. And I was like, Elizabeth, well, you know, maybe Angela's better, but I kind of wanted like a more exciting like share or something like that. They just weren't uh, fancy yeah. struck. <laughs> but friends call me Angie, so you can call me Angie. Oh, okay. See I never went by that. The other name that I've been playing with is Ella, so you don't you know chop it off the other way. Oh. <laughs> of course that means people are like, do you use the one L or two L's? I'm like, no no no. You have to make it correct and add the L. I'm sorry. Yeah, I never even thought about that. I have to ponder that one for a little while. Hey, you see, aren't you glad you're talking to me? I kind of like having my secret name for friends. It's like, you can call me Angie, yeah. but other people know me as Angela. Sounds more official instead of like, oh, this is your in the know. <laughs> I was really excited when I saw that there was going to be a witch cozy mystery. I'm curious what made you want to write about witches in, in the cozy mystery world because Again, I feel as if there'll like be a random pop up of a cozy mystery that's paranormal inspired. Mm -hmm. But again, they always have to stand on their own and be unique. So I'm just curious how you made your, how you came to create your world because it is unique. It does stand by itself, and you're not gonna be going, oh, it's exactly like X Y Z because it's not. You created your own I'm universe. So glad to hear that. You know, <laughs> I had a really hard time deciding about. So I, my agent 
had mm-hmm. talked to the, the editor in chief at Kensington. Yeah. He said, I want a book about, you know, a witch librarian and her cat. And oh, so he the, told you? <laughs> yeah, he did. Because when he went around and asked, yeah. you know, what are you looking for? He said, I want a book about. So then yeah. they emailed me and said, What do you think about doing a proposal? And mm-hmm. my only parameters were witch librarian and cat. And my first thought was, No, I'm not going to do this. I don't want to write about a witch librarian. And, but I didn't want to say that. Yeah. So I said, I'll call you in a week. And then during that mm-hmm. week, I just like, I really, really want to write about a witch librarian and a cat. And I just started, because I think I was sort of scared of this idea of writing about a witch. Like, what am I going to write? How, how do I, how can I make a witch that's like convincing and relatable? Yeah. And, and then this idea, I was, there's a bookstore in Portland. It closed now during the pandemic, sadly. Oh. But it has this, these steps going upstairs. And then there were books sort of sayings on the steps. And one of them was Alice Hoffman's quote, um, books are the only real magic. And just like, and it just clicked in my head. And I thought, that's it. That is what it can make her magic. It's books. It's like she gets her magic from books. And the books will never be entirely clear. And she can misread stuff. And, and I'm still kind of making up magic. Well, she's books. a novice. So that works in your favor, right? Yeah, it does. <laughs> well, that was another thing I decided. Like, when I first wrote the very first chapter, um, I had her showing up at the library with a cat in a basket. And she already knows she's a witch. And it's like, you know, I brought the back. It's like, no, what about she discovers she's a witch? And there's like no one around to tell her why these books are talking to her. And then the cat just shows up. I love the cat because I'm an animal lover. So I love the books that have the cozy companions. Every so often I'll come across a cozy mystery that will have the animal on the cover. And then it's the pet in the background where, oh, we're coming home to give this animal a treat. Yeah. But I love that you have that familiar element. The cat is a part of the story. The cat is important to your sleuther. Yeah. Well, I love animals too. I love animals. I do. I like to. <laughs> I do. It's like I can, everybody in the book can be murdered except for Josie. And that, you know, that would be sad. But if anybody even hurts that cat tiniest bit, you know, it's like, that's just unacceptable. But I have a little black cat. I have a big fat gray tabby too. But I have a little cat, Bitsy Lamouche. And so I just think about her, even though Rodney is a boy and he's really yeah. a troublemaker, he's a naughty cat. But I just, so I want him to be involved. It's like, I can just, mm-hmm. you know, I can feel that little kind of body. Cause even on the side of the spine, you have your little companion. I know. And whenever I see this on my bookcase, I smile because it's not just the title and the name. You have your little cat too. And they're all like a little different. (laughs) Which is also true. Which is also why I think it, again, I love Kensington. I'm going, they're doing a really good job with her book cover. (laughs) I (laughs) like them too. I know. And you never know. You know, if you're going to get good covers. You didn't contribute contribute to them. Well, they asked me for ideas. And I was like, well. And then once it got started with like books flying around and the cat and the little stars and magic. Because even the books on the back, I I, I kind of picture them going up. It reminds me of one of those, it's the cartoon magical one where the guy has the books going into his travel bag and he's the wizard and you see the books flying. It gives me the magical vibes of the books moving. It it kind of has motion off the page, which I love. Yeah. Yeah, I liked it. Book four, there, Josie's sister comes to town, and then Josie, Josie's sister doesn't know she's a witch, and her mother's like, don't tell her, you know, you know, she already has enough inferiority complex. She doesn't need to know that you're magic. And so she, but of course she finds out. And so, but, so Josie has to explain mm-hmm. about the magic in their family and Rodney, and you know, her sister's like, so Rodney's your familiar? She's like, no, he's my cat friend. <laughs> but they, so it was kind of fun to explain it. Yeah. You know? And I've been kind of making up the stuff as I go, too. So, you know, like it gives me a chance to like think about, like, where am I really with this whole magic system? You don't have a, uh, I mean, sometimes they have that, we have our series Bible, we're going to write everything out beforehand and stick to this uh-huh. completely. I like the idea that you're learning as you go to figure out what's going to help the narrative best versus this is my idea. I'm going to stick to it. <laughs> right. Yeah. And I am. I'm sort of learning as I go, but then there's always the like, I don't want to jump the shark. You know, I don't want to like go, like get too far out That's of here. That's a great reference. <laughs> oh, I don't want to do that. And then I do kind of have a series Bible that I've been trying to keep up, but then I forget stuff. And so I'm starting book six and I want her mom to come out. And then I was thinking, did I ever give her mom a name? It's like, I can't remember. So I'm going to have to go back to the books. And the dad, I feel like the dad might be named Gerald, but he also, maybe he's not. So I have to go through all these books and like, you know, 
That's amazing. You're like, his name. Because even then, too, again, I've read the books, and my first thought is she says dad, mom, things like, hey, she, she doesn't, I mean, she the first child, first. you're not going to call them by the first name. Yeah. So if it was referenced one, <laughs> once, it was probably in passing. I know. Didn't jump out at me. So again, I'm not, it's not coming to me. I, I don't know. I don't think I feel like the mom might have mentioned the dad's name. Yeah. Uh, and so anyway, I'm going to have to go through. And then I kind of don't like looking at my books when they're done. So I'm afraid I'm going to look at it and go, oh, I should have done that sentence differently. Oh, I should have made that. So, um, but I'm going to have to just fuck up and do it. I love the fact that you just said there's a book six because I never know what's going on until something's listed as an arc or someone yeah. has a cover reveal or they announce their contract. It's going through at least six, but then I start in book five, uh, an arc that I really want to be three books mm -hmm. and it's kind of, there's some kind of exciting drama that happens. So I'm hoping that there's going to be, you know, seven or seven, eight, nine, because I really want to tie that up in book seven. Now I'm intrigued. I'm going, oh, what is the drama? Because <laughs> um, I'm also thinking, oh, there's a love interest. Is this the complicated love interest? What is this drama? Uh, yeah, it, I can tell you it feeds into it. But in book four, there's going to be a lot more action on that front. I've studied the romance genre for so many years at this point. Every time there's a romance narrative, I'm going, how is this going to end? Where's this going? I know. It's really hard with romance and cozies because on the one hand, if you resolve the romance, it's like, wah, wah, wah. You know, it's like all the air kind of goes out of that. And then, but on the other hand, it also is really bogus to keep stringing it along, too. Yes, there's a, there's a certain series that just came to mind. I'm going, you still haven't chosen between these two men or... Right, oh, and then there's a the chew. Yeah, it's like, oh, there's a, the boy next door, and then there's the dangerous one, and then there's this back and forth, and like, oh, like, oh. There's one series that I read and I was enjoying, and all of a sudden, the man, my book boyfriend, she leaves him, and then they break up for three books, and they get back together, and I was so mad for those three books. Uh -huh. I was just going, I don't care about the mystery. You broke up with him. I know. <laughs> I, I, was on his side. I know. I know. Well, if you, if you make him a good book boyfriend, then you are on his side. Mm -hmm. So I feel like Sam is a good book boyfriend. He here. is. He's, he's kind of really in some ways and kind of clueless in some ways. But yeah. I yeah. enjoy him. Yeah. He, like, he is book boyfriend material. I'm not going, oh, why did you, why, why is he the love interest? I'm going, she was this guy. <laughs> I know. Well, and she wants to, but she doesn't know. Well, you'll see. You'll see. She You're like, that's to. how you have to read the book. <laughs> right. But yeah, the this, I, I kind of went and reading a book and it's like, you know, I met the, you know, the police detective was the hottest man I've ever seen. It's like, that's not very interesting to me. It's not because like when somebody you really love is usually, kind of a little bit wacky and can be annoying occasionally, but you love him, you know? I mean, he's not perfect. Yeah, he's not he like, might actually snore. <laughs> right, or, yeah. It just like kind of be clueless about stuff and... Well, true, you also have a lot of different things going on because you have the magic, you have the mystery, that you have multiple balls up in the air that you're juggling because I'm going, you have the romance narrative, you have the family dynamics, you have a lot of moving but pieces. You gotta do it. You gotta do it because you gotta keep pulling murders out. And pretty soon if you've like knocked off the whole panel, you've like you you've played out all of your subplots. So yeah, like the people in the town, I'm trying to add a few in and then, you know, so that there's reasons for I'm not that I want any of them to die, but you know, you gotta like you gotta keep tending that garden. I have these moments of okay, we're in the small town. It's not Cabot Co. because I would have left by now. You still have to, <laughs> it's like you wanna read about this place, you don't wanna be the actual resident of because as soon as you're the resident there's a potential you know yeah. you gotta like put extra firm locks on yeah the like there's a target on your back yeah. and live in these yeah. towns as soon as yeah. someone introduces a character i'm going oh boy <laughs> what's gonna happen to you what is your I thing know. i know that is always a big thing too it's like how do you find the person to murder it's just like if somebody's new in town either they're a murderer or they're gonna be dead real soon so like that's a problem and um, then the problem is, why does your sleuth get involved? I mean, she's a librarian. Why is she like, I'm going to go find me a murderer? You know, so you have to have good reasons. And so it can be, it can be tricky. But you know, it's so much fun. Yeah. It's like, what's the best thing in the world? Yeah. Get up in the morning, make coffee, feed the cats. And then have a cat on your lap. And then just like go to this magical place that you invent. Yeah. And you put the things in that you love. Oh. I think this is what I love about the cozy mystery subgenre is that 
the people who write cozies are the readers. So yeah. that's why when I read your book, I mean, you read, you see the title, it has the pun, you see the cover, but then you read it, you're going, we're checking off this box and this box that I'm looking for. Oh, we have the likable amateur sleuth, but she's also funny. And oh, we have this little <laughs> sleuthing duo dynamic over here. I really enjoy the library and the bookstore sleuthers because again, we're all book lovers. It's what we, it's who yeah. we are. And I think when it comes to libraries, and you do this extraordinarily well. You have the opportunity to incorporate so much of the community. With the library versus the bookstore, the patrons can only meander around for so long before they have to leave. Yeah. But I love that you have the regulars, you have people that are reoccurring, you have the staff. I like that you were able to, again, you almost have a community within the community in a way. Well, it's so fun to, that's why, well, first of all, I knew, so I knew I needed a witch, I knew I needed a cat, mm -hmm. and I knew I needed a library. And so my first thought was, well, you know, what a library. Think of like a municipal building. And I was like, no, this is my library. I ain't a yeah. library. I want, I'm putting that library in a freaking Victorian house. Yeah, that's it's what I'm saying. It's unique. unique. <laughs> right? And then I thought, well, what does a house have that has a big kitchen? And it's a small town. What do people just hang out there in the kitchen? Yeah. That's why I was trying to say it's the go-to place for these characters, yeah. which I think is so brilliant. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> because like, I was trying to think how to, because again, I love libraries. But my hometown library is, I mean, it's a library and it is, you know, the chairs are not the most comfortable and right. you get hungry and you have to leave and because they don't yeah. put food in there. <laughs> and so when you, again, you have it set in the house, I'm going, I'm like, this is really clever. And it's fun for me because I can have her going into rooms and there's like old marble fireplaces and chandeliers with some of the crystals falling off and old mm. rugs and brocade cards. So it's like, that's fun for me because I like that stuff. But then, yeah, I can have like the knitting club hanging out in the conservatory, mm -hmm. making trouble. And the book that's coming out, well, I'm not going to put any spoilers, but the knitting club plays a big role there. And it's just fun. It's just fun to make this world. Because I was trying to figure out how to say it too, because the library feels extra cozy. You took it and then you made it a couple levels higher because it makes you feel invited as the patron. So you want to stay with her in this library and just live there because yes, there's another book series that has to do with the library and there's a little bit of magic, but it's kind of magical realism that's really, really distant. There's just like one element of magic, um, but she just exists in her office and uh -huh. that's where she sits. That's where she does her stuff, uh -huh. but there are interactions throughout the house. Yeah. Like, it's not just in that one office or in that one <laughs> book aisle. Yeah. Right. The office is important, but the office in the small place. That was another reason why I wanted to put in, to stick a pipe organ in the old dressing room yeah. upstairs. Because I just thought, again, a very clever detail. Oh, this, would, this would be hilarious. What if there's this lady, Mrs. Garlington, who comes in and has organ lessons? And, and I don't know, it just, yeah. That's why I was trying to figure out how to say it, of going, I was trying to be vague because you have those details that just make me so happy because so they, those characters, they have a reason to be there. It makes sense. Every so often when it comes to the bookstore cozy, I'm like, they better have purchased something at this point. Why are they still here? Mm -hmm. <laughs> Your characters make sense. And so, I'm so glad. you have the magical, but we're not suspending the disbelief onto the, okay, these characters are just going to run into each other because that's what the plot needs. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so I, I appreciate the thought behind it as you're describing the library. I was trying to figure out, okay, how much do I reveal? How much do you let the reader figure out picking this up going, wait a second, there's a what? <laughs> it's yeah. just, how did you think of that? Because I have never encountered a library where it's set up like that. I've never seen a house library <laughs> like this. I know. I think man, maybe there was never one. There's not one in the world. And it's just in your brain that you're well, I, I know I went in a Victorian house mm -hmm. and then I love to go to thrift stores and yeah. I mean, it's like a bad house. I have like so but I one of the things I like to look for just because they just you can just like look at them and imagine are yeah. books of old floor plans oh and I have found lots of them so I have this book of Victorian floor plans and so I just flipped through it until I found one an Italian Victorian house and I thought this is this is it this is my library so it has a tower in the front so and I took the servants quarters on the third floor I amended a little bit like the, yeah. the laundry became the pantry and stuff like that and just decided I would make it, that would be my library. 
So uh, then, then I planned it all out. I went and made Xerox copies of it so I could draw over the yeah. rooms and decide, like, oh, here's where art of history goes. Here's where natural science goes. And so that's what I did. And then I also think about, like, houses. Like, also, I love visiting historic houses. And I am so nosy. When it starts, when the sun starts to set, and but people haven't shut their windows yet, mm -hmm. and I'm the first who walks up the street, I'm like, look at these houses. Because it's just so fascinating to me. So... You know, so then I could figure like, oh, there's a tile floor and there's going to be some stained glass. And, and so that's where I got started. And then stuff like the organ, there's a woman I know who plays the organ and she's getting up there in a year. She basically yeah. plays funerals and we you know the church yeah. organist is sick or something. Yeah. Yeah. yeah I love that. I want that character. I love that you took, you're writing what you know, you're taking those different things going, oh, this works here because I was weirdly fascinated by the fact that this was a library in the house because again i'm going i don't think i've read this before when it comes to cozy mysteries there are certain things where okay we have our bed and breakfast we're going to do the bed and breakfast and it's going to be this theme it's going to be set in this location mm -hmm. that's going to be the factor. Be sure in that, yeah and so you have that kind of set thing and you have to try and figure out how to make it your own for this story so that it's not just a b and b it's your b and b you took this library and you, I mean, you took the library idea and made it your own. <laughs> and I was so impressed by that because it's so hard to do something new with an old idea like that. I'm glad you liked it. You know, it's like I'm spending hours and hours and hours there. So I better like it. I think maybe that's why I enjoy it so much because you enjoy writing it. It shows on the page. <laughs> I'm so glad. And there's some room still in this house. Like I know there's a basement and I know there's a furnace that factors into book four. I think there, yeah, there's stuff in the basement, and then the way that I envisioned Josie's apartment, there's kind of an area that she hasn't gone into, and so it's like there's, and of course if she was me, she would have been like getting through that door instantly. What's back here? But there's an there's a potential for like secret rooms and stuff. So I like I'm this. Like finally, that away. Yeah. Well, because Victorian houses, they used to have those secret panels, these yeah. hidden apartments. Yeah, there could be a secret room we don't know about. Oh, there could be multiple rooms. Maybe the secret staircase. I don't know. I don't think. But yeah, so there's some areas she hasn't gone to. There's some potential. I'm curious if you came up with these titles because you are, these are some of my all time favorite cozy titles. I remember just gushing about them in an Instagram story one time, oh, going, yeah. this is one of the best puns. Bait and Witch, when I first read that, like even just saying that now, I'm smiling. <laughs> I'm so glad you like it. Send me your witch, which I'm thinking. And I tried to make it actually related to the story. You, so, you come up with them? Yeah. But I'm teaching not, your punny way. I am not good. I am really not good at it. <laughs> so I have in my last newsletter, I asked readers, it's like, please just send me in your ideas. If I can mm -hmm. use your idea, then I'll put you in my book somehow. We'll figure out a way to do it. So the next one is Witch Upon the Star. The one after that's Gone with the Witch. And then, then I'm, I'm at a dead end. But it, does it have to be literary related with this title? Yeah, but Witch needs to be in it somehow. Oh, absolutely. So someone sent me a suggestion for Witchblade. I thought that was good. Witchy washy. Witch, witchy washy. My first thought, I just thought, I'm like, I'm going, this might not be entirely appropriate, but I was like, Witch Please. <laughs> yeah, please. Witch Please or the Witch is back. That's cute. Yeah. The wish yeah. is back. I like that. That could happen, actually. That could relate. Because you just said the mother's coming to town. Yeah. Did we just figure out the title? <laughs> yeah. That would be books of the witch is back. Ooh. <laughs> oh, that could be. This was actually. I'm, I'm going. That could be a, a clue to book seven too, because there was a thing. No, I was talking about that. Art. Yeah. You're going. Oh, do you need a piece of paper to write this down? <laughs> I'm not going to forget that. I'm not going to forget that. Okay, that could, that could be, I can see that happen. I think you just made me into, so happy. I'm like, I just helped somehow. <laughs> you just did. Because I like the fact you have Witch in all the titles, but I'm so blown away by the titles. They're so fun. I'm just so impressed that you came up with them. I don't know how you do that. <laughs> you just did this now, but I'm also blown away by it. Yeah, you just came up with one. I love how like I have all these pertinent questions like I'm just gonna chat with her because you're just so easy to converse with you're just so sweet and now I'm curious what this title is gonna end up being you know this is gonna be on my mind where I'm randomly gonna be driving one day and be like I wonder what she came up I'll with let you know. <laughs> I am curious because I'm also kind of blown away by how quickly you're doing this series because I, what are you doing one a year now practically every nine months you have nine months to do your completed 
fully edited it's version? Or just, people, yeah. Well, no, I have nine months to write it. Okay. And then I turn it in. And then and then they come out every nine mm -hmm. months. So yeah. You have a quick turnaround time, I feel as though. There are some people who write them a lot faster. But I mean, I really want mine to be, I want them to be good. It's like, I guess one time, well, I want them to be like interesting plot and complex. And I want them to be well written. So some people can like three weeks, boom, I'm done. I just can't do that. I just don't, you know, I just don't have the ability. Well, you're also creating an entire universe. So I think you kind of get a pass on that I too. Do. I have a lot of other things, other balls in the air that I'm trying to catch and make sure they stay. When it comes to writing and you have, again, those details that you have to keep crystal clear. I, I think it's easier to write something super quickly if it's the first thing you're just trying to get the ideas down on paper but mm -hmm. when you have something that you need to again put out into the world and a publisher will be reading I yeah. appreciate personally if you take your time with it instead of just thinking oh I have a deadline publisher wants it boom yeah I yeah and it's good that's good my name's on it I want it to be enjoyable and figuring out like trying to plot a history it's kind of like algebra in some ways so you have to think of like, I have these different factors, I have these different possible motives, I have these different opportunities, but I don't want something too obvious. I mean, you know, it's so... Yeah, because the other part is, okay, we need the red herrings, we need them to be plausible, mm -hmm. but we don't want you to be disappointed when it's not the red herring. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it feels as if you were cheated. And then, but it can't be so complex that it's impossible to figure out. And some people, I think they don't read books, they don't really care that much about the murder. They just want to be in the world. Yeah. You know, see what's happening with the people. And I just want to be in a Victorian library. <laughs> I do too. I want this to be, I'm like, can we just put it out there in the universe? Be like the secret if I put it out there, will like, you like, come into being? I want to be there too. I do. I think I'm jealous of the fictional world. <laughs> because my town library, I've been going there to do things. There's a puppy in my house. And so in order to oh. get work done, I need to have my mother babysit said puppy and I go elsewhere. <laughs> Yeah. And so they have very uncomfortable chairs. It's a little drafty. The windows are kind of so so, and all of a sudden the sunlight's blaring. So yeah. then I read this and I'm going, oh, the comfiness. It I just know, feels cozy. Chair. I know. I'm kind of also picturing at some point there needs to be an illustration of this this fictional place with yeah. her and the cat in front of it, like the entire building. That's a great idea. <laughs> or have a floor plan. You know, like they did in the old mysteries, or a map of the town. I love it. I love fictional maps. They make me so happy. Me too. I look at them over and over again, and then you know, I'll read into the. And they, uh, there used to be lots of them for old books. Mm -hmm. I'll read in the book, and then I'll just go back and look at it again. Yeah. No, I love fictional maps and floor plans. So you do have your own floor plan that you I do. created, but I am curious, did you make a, a handwritten map of the town or use something to I do. Track? Yeah, I've made it a couple times, and then I realized. I didn't put enough buildings this time because you know you gotta get some murder sprinkled around. It can't mm -hmm. always be happening in the same place, so yeah, I, nobody would ever go there. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So I'm kind of yeah. So I'm expanding the town. I'm like I'm naming more buildings, but they're boarded up and like I added a boarded up theater mm -hmm. and stuff like that. But you couldn't like it, I should have mentioned it earlier, so I made it like oh, it doesn't really look like a theater right now. So it's just another building. And, Again, I just want to kind of meander around the small towns because you they just give you those cozy vibes and that's why when you're mentioning reading them, I'm going, that's why she's checking off all of these boxes that I'm looking for. <laughs> so I'm just, I I'm, am curious though, because you do have the quick turnaround time, do you plot them out? Do you think, are you a panster? How do you create these, I was going to say, complex stories with so many moving pieces? Well, I, so usually I start with like some little bit of an idea, like for the next book, so this would be book six, I'm thinking I want to do something with poison pen letters, because I love those in the old books, it's kind of like a classic trope, yeah. poison pen letters, so like, okay, so that's why I start with poison pen letters, and then, you know, I got the switch librarian, I got a cat, and then there's this other subplot I was talking about that I won't spoil for you right now, so I know I need to work that in, and... So then I'll just start thinking, like it's in the back of my mind, so while I'm doing dishes or other stuff, it starts to build. Mm -hmm. And then at some point I take, I have a big whiteboard and I chop it into four bits, acts one, two, three, and four. And acts mm -hmm. two and three are really act two, but just in the middle, I like have some kind of something unexpected yeah. happen. And then, um, and then at some point I feel like, oh, it's not, you know, it's like just not quite right. So mm -hmm. I have a friend, Lisa Albers, she's an author too. 
and I would go to her house, sometimes bring a bottle of wine, and if we're lucky, it's sunny, we can sit in her backyard, and she always says, like, um, you know, I really don't have very much imagination, but she is perfect. And once we start talking, she'll be like, wow, what about this? And you really should have this person hiding. And then do so she's, then I come up with lots of ideas. Yeah. It's always good. Everybody should have good brainstorming buddy. I love that you have her to kind of bounce ideas off of. Uh, yeah. See, maybe because I'm an introvert, I'm always concerned of like, how much do I reveal? Because my mother's always like, is someone going to steal your idea? Ideas can be oh, yeah. Will they run with it? Yeah. Even if you confide, will it become public? Yeah. Because they tweeted it. So I love that you have someone you trust enough to be like, this is what I'm working on. I, mm -hmm. I need your help, but I also need your complete confidence. Like you're going to be my confidant. Yeah. And, and she writes mysteries, but they're totally different. They're yeah. a lot more hardcore. I mean, which librarian? No, she would never go there. So I, you know, I feel like, and we can, we can just kind of get wacky. Yeah. Too. So yeah, she's a good person to talk about ideas. Yeah. And I have good friends who are great friends, but their brains just don't work that way. Yeah. It's really, for me, brainstorming with somebody else is easier. I can brainstorm with it. I have a big pad that's my special thinking pad. Yeah. And I can sit down with some coffee and a pen and start mm -hmm. to like, well, what if, well, what if this? I did it a little bit on the plane on the way out yeah. here too, trying to nail down some You characters. brought your thinking pad with you? I brought my travel thinking pad, which is a little bit smaller. So That's why I'm going, you brought this on the plane? <laughs> I was going to be so impressed to TSA was probably wondering what was going through. Yeah, what is this all about, this murdering and blood spatter and stuff? Should we so, be concerned? Yeah, <laughs> exactly. All right, so it's a little bit smaller, but still it's a grid and yeah. some topic grid. I don't know, so I did do a little bit of thinking. And then sometimes I think like you start that thinking process mm -hmm. and then it's actually happening while you're doing other stuff. Yeah. And then when you go back to the pad, it starts to spill out. So I don't know what that's called. But Even when you were talking and you said doing the dishes, I'm going, that's the, I get Christy, the, that's the quote with her. Oh this is why she's doing mystery. <laughs> and she also used to eat apples while she wrote. She would crunch these apples. She had a big bowl. And I have another theory about this. This is my, my brain theory. I'm like, I know nothing about like how the brain actually works. But you know, when you're writing, you write a lot of dialogue. Yeah. And I think that's why there's so many writers who are drinkers. Because <laughs> they're, you, you have to like keep your mouth busy because it's like your mouth somehow it needs to work while you're thinking about mm -hmm. these words. But you know, so it's better to write in the morning when you just got coffee and stuff like water or something that's safe to drink. But I think there's something about like you keep, as you keep your mouth busy. I mean, I very much end up, when I reread things, I tend to read them out loud. Lived on my own for quite a while. And so it was just me and the dog and I would pretend he was listening and yeah. I'd be like, well, I have another living being. So I'm not just talking to myself. Yeah. yeah. I didn't know about her and the apples. I'm like, I just learned something today. <laughs> Yeah, she would crunch these apples, and then she had her Ariadne Oliver, who was one of her characters, yeah. was a mystery writer, and she had the same habit. Going back a step, I'm so happy you have someone to bounce ideas off of, mm -hmm. and you're able to find your person, because mm -hmm. she also has to be either reading it or has to listen to you discuss it, so yeah, you have someone willing yeah, to donate it. your time, too. Well, yeah, no, I try to, like, bring her things yeah. to eat and drink to, like, get that for it. <laughs> But I just, I think that's such a fabulous dynamic to have because it's really helpful. it sounds as if you've created your own writing process of, I'm going to talk out loud and brainstorm with this person. I have my grid. I'm going to give myself time off to keep my hands busy, but let the brain wander. Mm -hmm. So you really have created your own, almost, I was going to say writing style, right? <laughs> but you just, you have your own unique way of doing yeah, it. Yeah, process. Yeah. I, I think that every writer has a slightly different process too. But you it's know? working. I, I was like, so. <laughs> yeah. I was going, you have your end, but you have the end result. You have your book baby to show for it. Oh, my book baby's nine months in the making, everyone. I'm like, that's actually perfect. I know. That's a perfect example. <laughs> I love it. And so now if, you, if the book ever comes out later, you're like, it's past its due date. Yeah, it's like, hurry up. Um, I was curious if when you started writing A Cozy Mystery, so you mentioned before that they kind of gave you, not the premise, but a couple ideas to work with, but uh -huh. if there was a certain component of cozies, whether it's a trope, if it's something that you've seen a lot of or not enough of, if there's something you're going, oh, I'm ready to cozy, I need to include X. Uh -huh. This has to be there. Uh -huh. One thing I think is humor. You it's like, humor. to me, the world is so hilarious. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's really sad too, but it's sort of a, mm -hmm. you know, sad. but there's so much that's so funny. People are wonderful and hilarious. They are. 
And so I You're know, making me smile. That's <laughs> good. You're hilarious too. So am I. So am I. Like I have to, you know, I, like I feel like I have to, I, 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 I have to write funny. I mean, people who say, well, have you ever thought about writing some, something other than cozies, like cozies weren't enough? Mm -hmm. I think, no, because I mean, I just, I want to write funny. It just, yeah. this, I want to show how amazing and hilarious and remarkable and quirky the world is. It's like when somebody is done with my, one of my books, I want them to feel like they've been entertained. Yeah. But that they can look around their own world and like see aspects of those books in their own world. So that, I think I knew there had to be humor in it. So now the next question obviously has to be, do you have a favorite comedic scene, line of dialogue, something you're going, oh, I wrote this, I was so happy and I thought it was so funny and readers have, or readers have said this is my favorite scene because it made me laugh out loud. Is there a scene? There's a scene in which I'm famous that I think is hilarious. It's, I mean, you didn't even miss a beat. You're like, you knew exactly the answer, right? Yeah, was one, I remember I read it a lot to the friend I was talking about. And it's, 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 a, it's, a, it's a sort of an off scene. There's these two kids, Buffy and Thor, who are the kids, uh, Patty, who owns Patty's this and that. Yeah. And they are like total money grubbers. They are always out to like earn a buck. Buff, Thor, Buffy's the brains of the operation. She's like seven. She wears a lot of pink sparkly things. Thor, he tends to wear a cape, sometimes an eye patch for the front of it, and you know, but he's the older brother. Yeah. But they're always earning money. So there's a scene in which in Famous where Josie's trying to get information out of them and they're trying to get money out of her. And I just, I thought it was really funny. So, I mean, I don't know if other people think it's funny, but. I, see, those are the details, again, that make me so happy as a reader. The little kid wearing an eye patch, that is something a little kid would do. Yeah, totally. And then he flips it up when he really needs to look at something. <laughs> and then, you know, puts it back down. And, and capes. There are, there are kids who love to wear capes. They get over it, but they got a cape face, you know? And so he's doing the capes. And yeah, and, and I think I, I think I introduced him to Seven Year Witch, and, and Thor's trying to do magic tricks for money. But then I thought, I'm really going to run with it. So Buffy and Thor, named after my friends, Wiener dogs, Buffy. Oh, so I always think of Buffy the Vampire Slayer. That's what she was named after. Yeah. So it's like once removed from Buffy. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So yeah, there's that scene that I think is funny. And there's just odd little things that I think are just funny exchanges. Yeah. That I don't know if everybody gets it. But I mean, I have a good time writing them. So. That's important though, because you're going to be living in this world, yeah. writing I mean, thousands of words yeah. about this world. You, yeah. I hope you enjoy it, because otherwise yeah. it's going to be the worst job in the world to try and get that done. Exactly. It's like when there's writers who ask, you know, like, well, what, you know, they're thinking, they, uh, they, I want to get, mm -hmm. get my agent, want to get my book published, what's mm -hmm. market line, what is it? I just, I want to say, you know, you've got you've to gotta love what you're writing, because you're going to spend a lot of time in that world. And so make it a world you want to be a part of. Don't just think what's going to sell. I mean, you can, you can, if that's your thing. Yeah. Um, but you know, if you really, if you want to make money, go groom poodles or something, like do something else. Because <laughs> being an author is not, I mean, unless you're one of the, the select, it's not a way to make money. There's a lot of other, I mean, go sell mortgage insurance, whatever. But yeah, so you got to make it world you love. I am curious though, you did mention that your it was your agent and they were talking with the publishers and that's how this idea came into fruition. Uh-huh. But you already had your agent and editors, so this right. is clearly not the first book you've ever written. So no. what was the did you approach this differently than your previous book or books, shall we say? Well, you know, so I wrote so my first series I self-published and I stopped at five books, but I'm not stopping. There's gonna be other people. People have been asking me here at this conference when I'm gonna write the next, and it's plotted out, so I'm gonna write it. But that really just came, that was just, yeah. you know, from my mind. And then my second series, I wrote was Clover Taker, three books for Berkeley Friend Prep. That was a house series, so that meant that there was yeah. an editor in Berkeley who said, oh, I've got this idea about an open kite shop, and then wrote kind of a scenario. And I customized that a lot. I like a James and Murder Day come and see things like that, because I just, there's one character they wrote that was so annoying. I'm like, she's dying. I don't care what they say. <laughs> but so there, I, I like I had that structure already. Yeah. So for this, I just had a, a small amount. I mean, I had a witch, and she had to be a librarian, mm -hmm. and she had to have a cat. And that's all I knew. The rest was up to me. 
And you know, strangely, like having a small limitation can sometimes make you more imaginative. Like mm -hmm. if I told you, Angela, I want you to throw a party for me. Okay. And it's like, that's kind of a lot. Like, what yeah. do you mean? Is that, it's just like, it's hard to get. But if I said, okay, I want you to throw a party for me and here's a hundred dollars and invite these 10 people. Then it's like, then, all right, it's like, hey, actually, it's kind of a cheap party, but I mean, No, I was just thinking, like, is this a murder mystery? Edgar Allan Poe's murder mystery well, party like, for me, then, too. Well, then you're, like, limited enough. Yeah. And, like, somehow having those limits can really free up your imagination. Yeah. Then you think, okay, 10 people, yeah, I could set them out at dinner. So if we're going to be at a dinner, mm -hmm. then we could have a mystery party. Okay, with 100 bucks, all right, we're talking, like, some uh, macaroni and cheese, but, you know, or whatever. Pizza <laughs> delivery. Yeah, exactly. Cheap local think, place. I think I've got some coupons. <laughs> but if you have those... Sometimes having a small limitation can yeah. like really free you up. At least that's how it's been for me. Because even then when you said party, I'm going, is this a wedding party? Are we doing like a retro sort of thing where it's 50s and everyone right. has to come in costume? What are we doing? Right. <laughs> it's, it's like it's almost too big. Yeah. Like just having two limitations all of a sudden can like really. So that's kind of how I felt about this. But it worked for you, which makes me so happy because I enjoy it. I'm, so, I'm happy if it's your heart. So clearly this book series is coming along and you just mentioned you're going to be doing the self-published book as well. Is there another cozy mystery series that you're also thinking about or another cozy? Yes, there Ooh. is an idea that I've been talking with my agent about. I'm super excited about it. So I just turned in one book and I need to send in the synopsis for book six in this series. And then I want to spend some time plotting out this other book. I don't want to say too much about it right now. Oh, you know, I'm not sure. I know, but I do. I do like to talk about it. But just, you know, it's like sometimes I, this one I want to keep a little bit more. But there is something that I'm thinking about that sounds really fun to me. Would you go down traditional or self-publishing with it? I think traditional. I like doing having self-publishing. Like there are in one of these books. Baby Witch or maybe Seven Year Witch, there is, I do cross, a, one of the characters, who is a regular character in this series, was a character in Secret of Blue Lily, which is from mm -hmm. myself. Published. I mean, she like yeah. comes in, her daughter ends up getting murdered in Secret of Blue Lily, and she is the daughter of um, Ruth Littlewood in this series. So there's like some cross. You do the time in? Yeah, that's a good way to get people to go back to this series as well. That's kind of fun. It's good to like to combine the worlds. But yeah, the other series is not quite as cozy, but it's it's more traditional, but it's not. I mean, it's would it be mystery more, though? Like, yeah, they're mysteries. They they center around a vintage clothing shop in Portland. That is perfect for you. I feel as if you would do well with clothing stores oh, or fashion. I, I love vintage clothing, but I love history and old stuff. And like, if you can pick up a cool old dress to tonight, you're going to the banquet tonight? Yes. Okay, so you gotta check out my dress if I can get it set up. <laughs> if I can, I'd have a backup track dress so I can't. But I love like picking up an old dress yeah. and thinking, you know, what parties did this go to? Who wore it? Who loved yeah. it? Who bought it? And you know, like what necklaces do they wear? Like the history of stuff, I just love that. I love old stuff. It's just, it's so interesting to me. I was like, this is why I probably love your books so much because I relating to you so hard right now I'm going I do too <laughs> when, I, when I was in middle school that was when I first read Jane Austen and then I was going I have to go by and figure out what the fashion was during the Jane Austen now oh, yeah. the years before and the years after oh, yeah. so then I fell down I fell down the historical fashion hole pretty oh, quickly yeah. oh yeah what do you do contemporary would it be yeah so the vintage clothing series it does take place it is contemporary so the next book that I have sketched out but it doesn't involve old stuff too because there's old clothes. In the 1940s, uh, the French fashion industry was, I mean, Germany is occupied France yeah. and they were trying to stay alive. So they made these little dolls and dressed them like the, like, you know, Jean Pantou made like little Jean Pantou dress, everything down to little underwear, tiny little jewels <laughs> and shoes in it. I mean, like really everything. Wow. And then, so they made all these famous designers made these yeah. dolls and then um, Christian Bergard and some other artists made sets for them. Mm -hmm. And then they traveled all around. It was just like, see French, French fashion is alive and they call it Teatro La Mode. So like theater of fashion. Yeah. And they travel all around and then in the early 50s they kind of disappeared. Mm -hmm. And what had happened is that they had stopped in San Francisco at this, this department store and somebody just stopped them in the basement. Oh, and this in the 1980s, somebody discovered them and they yeah. pulled them out and they had, they rehabilitated the dolls and then they went to live. So they're these amazing fashion dolls. And then they went to live 
bizarrely in this museum in Eastern Washington, that's in the middle of nowhere, it's in a mansion in the middle of nowhere. And that had to do with Queen Romania, or Queen Marie of Romania, and this crazy widow of a sugar fortune. This is all true. I'm, I'm like, which biographies and or, like, I mean, there's a you lot know. of different information that you're pulling from. But like, so how weird. did you learn it's all so of this? Weird. And but I love it. I'm like, I tell me more. Yeah, it's really, it's so bizarre. I can't remember the widow's name right next to that book. I thought it out. It's been a while now. She had this hilarious name. She was this like crude, big woman who, who married some guy, the sugar king. How did you even yeah. find, I mean, this is, how did you find out about I this? I was was really fascinated about that. I thought, yeah. what would a finished clothing store owner get like a box, shows up in her store, and she unwraps it, and it has one of these dolls in it, and the doll is like beheaded. And then she realizes, oh, this is from the Teatro La Mode. So she drives out, it's like, like a little over a two hour drive mm -hmm. to this museum, called Mary Hill Museum, um, which is like, it's in the middle of this desert, right up on the river. It's a weird, weird place. And so she drives and at the, you know, then the mystery sort of starts to unfold from there. And I think I'm including um, the, a famous yodeling rapper. <laughs> How does your brain That's work? Dog. That's amazing. I just think like, these things are funny and I'm like, yodeling rapper. Do you just have words in a jar that you just were like, okay, we're going to have all the adjectives, maybe a few nouns. <laughs> That's a good idea. I, I'm trying to, how do you come up with that one? That's a good idea. Yeah, just the things that I think are funny and that, so anyway, that's, see if you're getting me all worked up about this. I gotta write that. <laughs> I'm trying to write all these things. I know, you're like, I have a reader, she needs this stuff. I get a better, I gotta get a better work ethic. Well, because even when you were talking about her, my, my first thought was, well, if these designers created these dolls, well, the dolls are worth a fortune. If one of them goes missing, right. there's a... There's a story there. Right. How did it go missing? Why? So when, so the dolls then got, they were donated to, so they were in the basement of this, this department store in San Francisco. Then they got shipped up to the museum. The museum was like, we don't need a bunch of dolls. You know, we got this, like we most were interested in Native American artifacts and stuff yeah. like that. So the dolls were sort of put away and then like vol kids of the, of the volunteers at the museum would play with them and switch around their outfits and stuff. Oh, wow. And then some disappeared and so, you know, there's like, there's a story there too. I also kind of love how this is something so specific about historical fashion because even when you brought it up, I went down the rabbit hole of, wow, women in their corsets, what were the corsets made yeah. out of and how they yeah. evolved yeah. and then about the laces and how women had to spend their, their little money on something like that. Like I went down a totally different fashion rabbit hole, but I love that like you're talking about this and I'm like, yes, tell me more because there's so much that you can pull from and work from and just saying historical fashion and then you make it so specific like that the reader's going i'm learning this is great i'm into i mean i love the the topic it's just it was, it was i need to learn more about this it was so cool. it's, it's like there needs to be one of those documentaries of here's a random thing from netflix <laughs> I know. it's like you can be the executive producer behind it oh i would love it yeah i would paychecks would be really good for netflix oh absolutely <laughs> <laughs> i know one of my questions that i wrote down was if there was something about yourself or your series that readers might not already know about you or your characters, if there's something that you're going, oh, I would love to share this fact, I would love to hear it. Well, one thing, I'm sure I'll think like a million things since I leave this room, but one thing is I love to use the names of my friends' pets for things. Like I told you about Buffy yeah. and Thor, who the wiener dogs are such cute dogs. And then the river that flows through Wilfred, the Kirby River, is named yeah. after my friend J.D. Forms, Chihuahua Kirby. And it's just so cute. So, yeah, because you know, when, when you're writing the books, you can make a lot of names for stuff. Mm -hmm. So I tend to just draw from the animal population near me. <laughs> but that's really sweet. And I feel as if that's also kind of paying homage to your friends and kind of letting them know how much you appreciate them. and. You wish them well with everything, including their animals and being an yeah. animal lover. There's a nice tie in there. That's a great answer, but it shows so much else about you too. Oh, that's really nice. <laughs> also, you Not know their names. Oh, no, yeah. I mean, you know the pet's names. And the fact that you do says so much about you. Also, if I'm your friend, I'm going to be so honored that the name is in there. And then I have to buy a million copies and get it to all my friends. And it's like <laughs> this friendship circle of, we love our animals. <laughs> Oh, I put that Max in then. No. If I use if I use the witch's back, we'll just stick Max in somewhere. 
So first of all, I have to ask where people can find you so they know where to get all of their latest witchy information and be on the lookout for future TBR editions. Well, my, okay, so my website is AngelaMSanders.com and I produce sign for my newsletter. I think it's a good newsletter. Comes out every month if I can get it together. And I try to keep my latest news in that for sure. And then I, I uh, totally bailed on Facebook. But I am on Instagram as Angela.M.Sanders. I'm just, I'm so appreciative of you taking the time out of your Thank mass you. experience to Thank chat you. with me. Thanks for having me. I am super honored. Well, I am honored that I got to chat with you. I'm like, this has been the best Angela episode ever. It's like Angela Squared. <laughs> Thank you for watching. And please add her lovely paranormal books to your TV red list.